So what, what was the initial spark, the inspiration for you wanting to, to tell the story through archive? What, what, how did this all begin? Um, well, I'd done Velorama, obviously, and I was aware that... And I was working with John Grant. Um, we've, the last two years, been filming a feature documentary about his life and um, his work and his loves. I was working with him and, you know, awake in the night, I thought, actually... You know, what we really need to do, because it's quite frustrating working with his music, because his lyrics are so incredible, and his music is so intense, that actually when you're making a documentary about John, the music sort of gets lost, because he's an extraordinary person as well. And I wanted to just sort of immerse myself in his his music and his lyrics and the emotional story of gay lives and this shows a huge and, amount of trust in like in you for him to he, he was amazing yeah I mean, trust you with this this music he really it? did trust me and um we've become friends and so he trusted me and it's thanks to him that that we did this really he it wouldn't have been affordable if he hadn't been behind it but I, and I think you know that his lyrics give it a sort of emotional narrative rather than us making a film that's just a, a kind of list of of laws which I really resisted although we we sort of did that a bit in the 90s section um, but I resisted it because I thought you know basically queer lives aren't lived according to the law you know people still fall in love and hurt each other and have sex and break up and have to come out to their parents and um, his lyrics tend to talk to that much better than you know the history of yeah. of, the, of the gay. And then you get Quentin uh, coming uh, in, of an talking LGBTQ, sense. Uh, yeah. yeah, and those Quentin, bits, those my bits hero. Those go down the best. Oh, I, I think. love those, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It worked really well. You know, we were really aware that we're representing a very diverse community. It's not okay to say queer. This is queer, and that represents everyone. So we sort of fought amongst each other and struggled for the bits that we needed, and. So you worked with um, Archive before once with, with Velorama, yeah, haven't you? But this is yeah. the first time you'd probably immersed yourself. Velorama so wasn't much. sexy. It was, no. no, it was, yeah, bikes. <laughs> Bicycles. It was a little walk. Well, it was a bike ride in the park yeah. compared to this, yeah. yeah. But this was much more exciting, obviously, because yeah. it's such an extraordinary story, the story of this century. And actually, the 19th century doesn't have half as interesting a queer story as, as the 20th. Um, this is when it's all happened. Always with archive, you are often restricted to what was represented in mainstream media, um, although you can pick out those isolated breakthroughs like Girl Stroke Boy with, with Peter Straker, which is just wonderful. But do you want to say a bit more about the challenges of trying to represent the LGBT? Yeah, Q+? well, you know to ask that, Simon, because uh, yes, we, we, we suffered and suffered, <laughs> didn't we? Um, basically, uh, there were lots of iconic films that we couldn't have because of the budget. And there were also some incredible films like the Jarman, Isaac Julian, um, you know, Campbell X's work that we could have, which was fantastic. So we, we sort of, we had to accept that we couldn't have My Beautiful Laundrette, we couldn't have Weekend, uh, we could only have a tiny bit of oranges and not the only fruit. There were, there were loads of restrictions on what we could have. And also some of the more obscure stuff that we wanted was refused us too, according to rights or, you know, like a sort of sense of, you know, fear about what the mainstream will do with our queer representations, which I think is understandable. When we realised that we couldn't have those more expensive titles, we decided that actually it, we could make a virtue of it and that this film would be about the things that people haven't necessarily seen. Because actually the most surprising thing to us, thinking we'd seen everything, was that we were totally wrong. We hadn't seen everything at all. And there were loads of, loads of surprises for us. Um, and, you know, I mean, we just kept going to, my God, I haven't seen that. Have you? No. Like shameful but wonderful because we could share it yeah we really really wanted to use more than we did in fact of um the kind of archive footage that wasn't supposedly queer and actually i would have i could have made a film um from you know 80s tv that had nothing queer in it overtly whatsoever because I think that's what 
you know, when, when kids are growing up, you just find yourself on, the, whether it's in Coronation Street or EastEnders or whatever, you just find yourself. And we really, really, we talked about that a lot, didn't we? That we wanted those sort of subtextual um, queer references to come through, that we wanted um, to have a sense of uh, there not being any representation, actually, you know, unless you were represented as sick or ill or wrong or bad or illegal. The further uh, back you go, you have to become a detective, don't you? Yeah, it's, it's yeah. So we really, you know, and Andy, I don't know if anyone knows Andy Medhurst's uh, books, but he's brilliant at sort of finding those, um, you know, like little subtle queer, subtextual queerness in like mainstream culture. And uh, he writes about it and it, they're really great books. And so we, I was inspired by that. And we tried to find some things that weren't necessarily just about this sort of pathologizing of, of LGBTQI lives. Um, I don't know. I hope. I hope it's. I hope Queer Rama Two, when I'm really old, is a really fun story. I don't know. I feel concerned right now, but uh, you know, and and actually, you know, because this is a very British story globally. The the um, situation for queer people is a, is still more than half an effing nightmare. Maybe, you know, there should be a queer rama in every country. Well, also, this celebration of 67 is troubling in that it, it was is. not an end point. It was a sort of starting, you know, or a starting point. And yeah. we're still sort of, we're still going. Yeah, so they haven't apologised yet. No. Come on. You know, they pardoned gay people. We should be pardoning them. You know, they, they should be apologizing, begging, as Quentin says, you know, may I cross your <laughs> broad-minded threshold with my unworthy feet? Yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know. It's a dark, um, unsettled time. George Montague there, who said, you know, I won't accept a pardon. Mm. He's incredible. He lives on the seafront in Brighton. He's 94 now. And he's still campaigning for an apology. I'm glad you got that in. I'm really glad you got that, that clip in, actually. Yeah. 